Okay. Well, good to see everybody tonight. I know everybody's a little anxious about the weather. Well, I believe some of you are anxious about the weather. But uh, let's hope everybody stays out of line of sight of that thing and uh, everything goes well. A couple of announcements I need to make about that. And the first of those is there's uh, not going to be a Thursday morning class. That has been canceled just because of wanting to get the word out to everybody that comes to the Thursday morning class and just not knowing which direction that will go. So that's what's going on. And also, uh, I know that uh, y'all were expecting Jody, but you got me again because he's on the way back probably right now. Uh, probably, yeah, he is. Yeah, he's landing about, uh, they're supposed to land around midnight in uh, Orlando. So hopefully everything is going well with that and they have a safe trip on home. So uh, just a couple of updates. So you'll know that Karen Davis has moved, been moved out of ICU, but she is still at Advent and she's been placed in a, a room now there at Advent. So if you were considering going there, Judy Clark, let's don't forget about her. She's going to be a few more, I'm just going to say days, hopefully it won't be weeks, in rehab at uh, Hawthorne Village, but uh, she uh, appreciates anybody stopping by to see her because, you know, those things get lonely. And then, of course, Alfred D. Ambrosio is still recovering from his broken arm in surgery to remember him, and he is at Life Care. Uh, when you get to the front door of life care, about as far in that facility as you can walk, that's where his room is. I think you can get all 10,000 steps in one trip. No, but uh, it's, it's, it's back there. Uh, but it's okay. He's, he's got great spirit about it, and so it's going well. And um, there I know others that are shut in and things not going perfect for them right now, but let's remember them also in our thoughts and our prayers. Does anybody have anyone else that we need? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mickey's aunt is not doing well. Okay. And what was her name? Repeat. Sorry. Okay, that's right. Sorry. Okay. And Vic, Mickey's aunt is not doing well, May. So let's Think about her in our prayer and prayers. Anyone else? Sherry Miller. Hmm. Okay. Sherry Miller. Yep. Right. Okay, we'll do that. And then um, just a little reminder that as you plan for Lord's Day, remember that we start small groups and there's still room for some sign-ups. If you have not signed up for a small group, please take a look at it. The ones that are full are marked full, but there's plenty of room. So anyone else, anything before we begin? Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that we, first of all, can assemble tonight and be able to uh, continue to our study in the parables. And uh, tonight, as we talk about, uh, talk about prayer and the parables that we will discuss, we're thankful that we have this avenue, that it's been provided by the blood of your son, Jesus, that we can come to you in prayer in his name. And it's a wonderful thing that we're able to do. It's a wonderful thing that we can lift up our friends and loved ones and ones that we care about and part of our family here that are not doing well physically. Uh, just as mentioned, Sherry Miller is, uh, we're praying for her comfort as she goes through some tests at this time, but we're praying for recovery for Karen, Judy, and Alfred as they are having some difficulties and praying that they will continue to improve. We're praying that you will, uh, they will 
continue to have great faith in you that they have displayed all the years that we have known them. And Father, we thank you for just the opportunity to be able to lift their names up to you. And we're praying that you will heal them if it be thy will. Also, Father, we want to pray for the ones that are traveling, the people that are in the uh, eye of the storm, so to speak. And Father, we're just praying for safety for all involved that are working to uh, and, and able to do things that will keep people safe. Pray for those, those service people. Also pray for the ones that are in those line, in the, in the difficult places where the storm might possibly hit. But we're praying, Father, that uh, all will be safe and not as much damage as we're sometimes led to believe. But you, your will be done in those things, Father. We thank you for again for the opportunity to look at these parables and uh, think about the things that they would teach us. And so, uh, Father, with that being said, we thank you most of all for your son Jesus and the blessings that are provided through him, the promises that are made by our obedience to him. And we thank you for that. We thank you again for your grace and for your love for us. And that is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All righty, if you'll open your Bible and take a look at Luke 11, we're going to uh, tonight talk about three different parables, but the one thing that they all have in common is they all three talk about prayer. We're going to look at three different things that uh, have that in common, and that is prayer. And uh, <clears throat> there's all kinds of differences in the, in the prayers that we will excuse me, the parables and the prayers being made that we'll talk about, but the overall message is that uh, he wants us to pray. God wants us to pray. God shows us in these parables that he desires us to pray, that it is something that we need to have in our mind that, you know, it might seem like, well, I've done that before, I've done that, but I think we'll see in these parables that it is something that is very important. So in uh, Luke chapter 11, we're going to start with the friend at midnight. And that would be in verse 5, reading through verse 8. And we're going there first because it kind of sets up the context of what we'll be talking about. Noticing there in, in uh, Luke 11, 5 through 8. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. In other words, I don't have anything to feed him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, and of course that means asking again and asking again, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So some external indicators in that, some things that bring it all together. If you'll remember at the top of the chapter, we dropped right down to verse 5, but please notice with me, in verse 1, what he does, he, he has the example of the model prayer, how we should pray. And notice who asked him about it. He was praying. They noticed him off praying in a certain place. Uh, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be, your, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so with that being said, he, uh, he kind of gives them, uh, you know, a, a model of what a prayer should be like. Does that mean that's a rote prayer? Is it a rote prayer that we just, or is he trying to get us to include those things in our prayer. I can't hear you. An example, very good. And the example is, these are some things that you can include because they said, teach us to pray. So he lays out there an example of what it ought to be like. 
And of course, noticing that is kind of very interesting. And uh, you know, in this, let's just say this is a true to life situation. How do you think, what do you think? Do you think this could be a true to life situation? This parable we just read? Sure, okay. Uh, could it have happened in any way that the people around there could understand? You know, that sounds familiar. Tell me some reasons that might be familiar in that day and time. What was the Jewish custom of traveling? Okay, and if you follow with a lot of that travel, you'll note that a lot of them, why do you think they traveled at night? Very good. Same reason you might do it in Florida if we were on our hooves, if we all were having to get our steps in, going places. They did it because their custom was to many times travel with their family at night to avoid the heat, to avoid the heat of the day. And so that's the reason for that process and, and, and happening that way. Okay, we've already said that. So when somebody came to your door, He's trying to get us lined up contextually with what he's getting ready to teach us. When he gets that lined up, they had an obligation to help out if they could. They had an obligation to provide those things. And so it was a custom they had back in that day and time of being a good neighbor, so to speak, uh, inviting somebody in. And so they would do that. Um, he makes a strange comment in the, uh, in the parable to make it strange to me because uh, he said everybody was in bed, you know, in the same room, in the same place, in the same bed, and they didn't want to get all that, uh, wake everybody up. So I want you to think about in that day and time in those homes, they had a central, so to speak, sleeping room and they generally i guess just piled them in if you came to my house back when we had a few children that age you know that you bunk beds were part of you know going this way but uh there was a central thought of we have one central sleeping room and so that's the purpose of what he says there don't trouble me my children are in my bed they're already all tucked away, they've had their story, and they're all tucked away. Don't want to be bothering them, okay? So uh, let me ask you, uh, so the audience could understand all those things that he said and all the things that he pointed out. Uh, tell me what, you, no, my wife told me not to say tell me. Sorry. Do you think there's special significance him asking for three loaves in this story. Is there any special significance to asking for three loaves? Excuse me? No, no special significance. Anybody else? They say that was enough for one or two or three. How many were fed with five loaves? Okay, so you get the idea. Uh, probably just enough, three loaves was enough to satisfy the hunger of the group that was traveling, was probably what it was about. And so just remember, in that day and time, that's the way things happen. That's the reason for the parable, or one of the reasons. Uh, this parable, is it teaching us that God's not really interested in helping us out of love or friendship, but rather only roused up to help because he is a brother. What do you think? Is that the only reason God would be interested in our prayer? No, okay, I agree. So the very point of the parable argues that, you know, it's got to be something that is teaching us 
Remember, it's not a new teaching. It's adding on to what they already knew, but something that they understand. Everybody in the audience could understand exactly what Jesus was saying. So he uses this parable to teach that lesson. He uses that to teach that valuable lesson. We must, there's two really good points that need to be made, two points that are back to back. And number one is I think, number one, we have to be persistent in our prayer. You notice that uh, it isn't done just one time. He comes back and asks again. You know, so we have to be persistent in our prayer, continually trying to seek the favor of God. And I know that sometimes we, uh, we uh, don't get what we want right away. We have to show faith and not give up. We need to continue to pray. Even though it's not answered in my time, God is going to answer in his time. You know, if it is something that God feels is worthy of doing. And the second thing that I think that we can see in this and is being taught in this parable is God is a loving, benevolent supplier of the things we need. He will listen and he will answer by providing all of our needs. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. Do you feel like that's a pretty good statement to make about our prayers to God? That he knows our needs? Everybody agree? God knows our needs? And he knows what kind of heart we're praying with? Certainly he does. He knows how we're praying and the want of our prayer. If it's just something that is being prayed about selfishly, I don't care how many times you pray about it, if it continues to be selfish and always inward, what it can do for me, I think sometimes, unless we're talking about our attitude or our heart, but if it's just something to get me ahead, you know, I think sometimes that God might just continue to think, hey, listen, you better keep asking, but you better get hooked up in your heart and your mind of really the way it needs to go. And, uh, but uh, God is absolutely benevolent and a uh, supplier of the things we need. I know that uh, this seems like a, a strange way to teach it, but it wasn't strange at all to them because they completely understood what was going on as he taught this parable. Anybody want to add anything to that, this parable? Anybody have anything? Okay. Let's take a look at the persistent widow in Luke 18, looking there in verse, uh, let's go all the way to Luke 18, and let's look at uh, verse 2. And it begins there, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary, somebody that's against her. Get justice for me. And he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. So he's really concerned about being wearied there with her constant ongoing and ongoing thing. So, uh, you know, it's amazing that, uh, that as we go through and look at that and going on down, uh, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect? who cry out day and night to him, though he bears along with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will really find, will he, will he find faith on the earth? And you know, it's something to think about. And, uh, you know, for us, uh, that men always ought to pray and, pray and not lose heart. And so it is just one of those things that is something that we never need to do. Have you ever thought about your own personal situation? 
I know that uh, as we reflect on these things that are being talked about here, we need to think about a lot of times, how do, how, what does this really mean to me? What does this parable really mean to me? What, what takes place in this kind of thing? What, what is really happening here? You know, uh, the thought that I pray and I pray and I pray, and guess what? Do I lose heart? Sometimes we do. Sometimes when we don't get the answer the way we want it or as quickly as we want it, we do lose heart. So that's valuable, very valuable words there for us to take to heart as we think about her. Okay, so let me ask, what differences do you see between this parable and the previous one? What is the difference? The jerk. The jerk? Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, we got a new word, jerk. Okay, everybody knows. So if anybody ever asks you to describe what a jerk is, just give them the parable and tell them there he is. Yeah, even though Jesus didn't call him that. What's the other difference you can see between this one and the previous one? One was a friend and the other one wasn't. And something that's big today in our society, one was a, and the other was a, no. <laughs> Hold on now, women can be jerks too. So, so what is the difference? One was a man, the other was a woman, exactly. So I just, right, right. Yeah, she's asking for, help with an adversary, somebody that was troubling her. He was just back. I'm a jerk. Get out of here, so to speak. So, yeah. So, yes. Right. Right? Right. I agree. Yep. Thank you. That's good. One was asking for the justice, as we already said, from the adversary. <clears throat> and the other was asking for what would you call what they asked for? Physical needs. Exactly. Yeah. Necessities of life. One is asking to, hey, take care of that guy for me. The other is asking for the necessities of life. Can't you give us three loaves? You know, and it, apparently that's all he, he knew. You know, his traveling group, he knew how much they would eat. You know, it's not going to, uh, it wasn't an all-you-can-eat deal. You know, it was, he knew that he probably ought to have something pretty lined up in his mind when he, when he asked for that. Uh, one of them was at what time of day, and the other one's at the what time of day? One was daytime, and the other one's at night, right? Banging on the door at night. I just want you to notice there's a difference in the two, and not that that means a whole lot, but, uh, you know, it just is, is interesting that, uh, you know, the necessities are asked for in the middle of the night, and in the daytime she goes to him, asking to help with the adversary. Uh, I think one of the lessons that we can learn from this parable is God will avenge the righteous who cry out for justice. I mean, if you're crying out to get an advantage over somebody or an advantage to you and not justice, I think we're going to have some difficulty. You know, and God would probably have some difficulty in, in handling it that way. But in this parable, it's a cry out for justice. And so I think that uh, one of the great lessons that you can learn from this, and I think you will agree with me, is that we constantly need to put our petitions, our prayers before God Almighty. That, he's the one that needs to be asked. We need to continually pour out our petitions, 
to God in prayer. And it needs to be something that we do on a regular basis. You know, it's not a, you know, it's, a, it's not something that we just one time and no answer and I'm finished. Second part of that, uh, God is telling in this parable that he will hear our cries and he will avenge us and our adversaries. He will avenge us is what that story, that parable has told us that that will take place. And so uh, the parable ends with the question that the Lord asks, and when he returns, he will find faith. Will he really find faith on earth? This is the kind of faith, I think, that we can answer by saying, yes, I think we can find that faith because of the persistent widow. You know, she was just constantly asking. Her faith that knew that if she hollered out and she kept continuing. And so when we persist in prayer, rather than give up, you know, we figure it'll never come. And so we give up. But no, we need to continue in our faith. So interesting there. Okay. Yes. She gave up quick. And you're right. I mean, I'm just saying, you know. And yeah, well, that's great. That's a great story. But yeah, I remember when that took place. You know, that's that's interesting. So, thank you for sharing that. Down here at our, uh, just a little history for y'all that aren't from around here. Excuse me. You're around here now. Down here at the, uh, down here at McPherson. I want you to know that that McPherson uh, uh, building there has a new sign out front, and it, it is called the McPherson House for Delinquent Women. So it was a time and a place when, uh, you know, and I shouldn't be sharing all this. This is kind of off our lesson, but... <clears throat> Between the ages of 13 and 15, if your child, your, excuse me, your daughter was delinquent and you lived in this part of Florida, you sent them to the McPherson school and they would take them in and it was kind of, I don't want to call it a jail, but it was only for delinquent teenage women. And it's still standing there, you know, and it's, it's interesting when you go in there and read those things. It's, it's very interesting, but uh, just, yes. Yes, sir. Right, right. 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 Yep. Obviously, yeah. I, I, right, yes. But that's, it's an amazing thing right down there on 25th. You ever have time to stop in? But not, I'm not encouraging you to. I'm just, I'm just letting you know when you brought up the prison, I thought it was interesting, delinquent teenage girls, but uh, that you were allowed to send them. Because I remember, you don't want to be a juvenile delinquent growing up. You better act right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to give you a little history. Sorry. 
Yes. So let's turn to 18. Yep. Oh, okay. So you're back on the topic? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Right? And I think it's important to recognize that God wants us. Right? You know, so I don't want to myself, I just want to say, well, I don't want to bother me about the gathering. Maybe I could be fair to people. Right. Right. He wants us to ask. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Hope everybody heard that. God wants us to keep asking. And, uh, Sometimes we teach our children, don't ask me that again, but whatever. So, All right, so let's take a look at the last one, the Pharisee and the publican in 1810. Let's take a look at that. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with, with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so with that, story, that parable being told, again, we deal with, with prayer. Again, we're dealing with prayer. And look at 18.9, uh, you know, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. And that's an interesting thing that uh, they felt that way. The Lord gives a final summation or conclusion to this parable and the meaning of the parable for all of us to learn. First of all, it's, it has two different contrasts. And I hope that you notice those. Contrast of two different kinds of people. And then a contrast of two different kinds of prayers. Notice what the Pharisee prayed. You know, he lines himself up and makes sure that he points out how bad all the others were. And then you'll notice when you come over to the other side of that, you will notice what is said. You know, the, par the Pharisee's description, uh, you know, he was really not even deserving of God having to hear him because he's trying to line himself up without everybody else. Uh, it's written down, I want you to notice this. The Pharisee took 33 words to tell God how great he was and made no petition to the Lord of the Lord whatsoever. The publican took seven words as all when he said what he said. He stood and prayed thus with himself while the publican stood afar off and would not as much raise his eyes to heaven and beat his breast, letting them know, hey, it's about me. So I think it's a good lesson for us to learn. How we act here on heaven is exact opposite is what he's really trying to say with the humbled and the exalted of how we would be traded in the afterlife. If we exalt ourselves before God, we will be humbled or humiliated, really would be a better word for it. And then if we humble ourselves before God, we will be exalted when the exalting needs to take place. So with those three parables, we focus back in on where I started at the beginning. God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray. He wants us to be persistent in our prayer. He wants us not to be worried too much about, I mean, certainly we petition God for things we desire, things that we want, but at the same time, please have the right heart, the right mind, as he tries to tell us there, and be very humbled as we pray to God. 
Anybody, anything on any of the three parables that you want to point out for our group? Anybody? Yes? Okay. Okay. I think the point that's being made here is God is not that much. I care about him so much that he's he's a penitent no matter what. So uh, I think of Paul, he asked three times for this uh, form of question to be produced, and uh, he's got his answer sufficient for each. He limited it to three times. But I think what we're talking about here, whenever we're just going to God with things, is that we can't help but ask him for that. Because for in the midst of our suffering, like that. So we, we can be rest assured that he hears us in our desperation. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to keep coming to him necessarily. That's not like it is a requirement because he hears us the very first time. Uh, but it is not that really we're going to it. We need to uh, be able to appeal to him because we can't help but speak out to him. We know he cares, we know that he loves us. And I agree. Good point. Any, yes, ma'am. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Everybody here, Sandra, not lose faith while we're praying. Very good comments. Anyone else about our three parables? Anyone? I know we, we all, Yes. Right? You know, and sometimes he's just waiting for us to make, I mean, he has given us a way out. He is opening the door, but somebody, not God, but me, I have to go through the door and I get it accomplished. I have to get up and do something to make that happen also. He will provide us a way, always will, if provided we're asking with the right kind of mind and right kind of heart and for the right reason. Anybody have anything else? Well, I know you'll be thankful that Jody will be landing tonight, and he'll be back. Uh, and uh, we'll be back in here again next Wednesday. Thank you so much for being here tonight.